With lithium batteries being more and more popular in our society in general and in the boating world specifically, the technology has come under the scrutiny of a lot of prominent people in the sailing industry that frankly, well, haven't had much opportunity to really examine all the aspects of the topic. From sailboats sinking because of lithium battery fires to entire electrical systems on board being destroyed by dump loads, alternator fires to the idea that lithium batteries can be drop in, the misinformation, confusion, and misunderstanding about lithium batteries has been rampant lately. And it's time we go myth busting. You're probably asking yourself, who's that dude on a YouTube sailing channel to tell me what's what about lithium batteries? Well, let me start by telling you a story and it all starts back in 2008. At the time, my college dorm buddy Mike asked me if I wanted to support a company that he wanted to create that would build electric bike conversion kits. I put 4,000 bucks in the project and Clean Republic was born. For cost control reasons, instead of purchasing the lithium batteries that would power those kits, we started building them ourselves and soon enough people wanted to buy the batteries alone. So in 2015, we raised some capital to develop a lithium battery brand that has since become popular in the world of the outdoors, Dakota Lithium. While I am mostly in charge of the management side of the business, one of our biggest successes was to develop new cathode material and proprietary electronics inside the packs that make our batteries more efficient while maintaining them competitive price-wise. This is not an ad by the way, it's just to tell you that I know exactly what's inside those batteries and how they work. In 2018, Sophie and I installed 680 amp hours of Dakota Lithium batteries on board Polar Seal, the absolute first Dakota Lithiums to make their way onto a sailboat and we have loved every single minute of having made the change. It has also given us the opportunity to put them to the test. Having sailed over 25,000 nautical miles, bashing through the waves of three ocean crossings, experiencing all temperature ranges and pushing their power charging and discharging demands. So what are the concerns about lithium batteries and how do we mitigate the risk? My good friend Brian on his 28 foot Beneteau Whisper is about to upgrade his old AGM batteries to a completely new lithium setup. So while we do some myth busting, we'll go check out what he has. First off, is my sailboat going to catch fire because of lithium batteries? The answer is probably not, or more appropriately, no greater risk than if you installed lead acid or carried petrol or cooking gas, which many of us do. Of course, only if you install the batteries correctly and install them smartly. Before we get into fire hazards, we need to understand some of the basics about how lithium batteries are made. You need to know that there are several different types of lithium battery chemistry, but here are the three most common. If we take a battery pack found in a boat and open it up, we will find cells inside. These cells can vary in size and shape depending on the pack's design. Most cells are either cylindrical, prismatic, or take the form of a pouch and they are structured and wired to make proper voltage and capacity for the design of the battery. Regardless of their chemistry, all cells will have an anode material, a cathode material, and some type of electrolyte or medium in which the electrons can flow between the anode and cathode, thus releasing stored energy. Here's where things get important and generally confusing for a lot of people. Not all lithium batteries are made out of the same material. There are many materials that we can make anode and cathode out of. Each of them have their own benefits and drawbacks, but all of them will affect the fire risk differently. First, we have lithium cobalt oxide or LCO. These batteries are commonly found inside phones, laptops, and cameras. It allows for high energy density in small spaces, but has a short cycle life or how many times it can be charged and discharged and cannot and should not be charged at high current rates. Then we have lithium nickel magnesium cobalt oxide or NMC. NMC is the choice of a lot of power tools, e-bikes and powertrain systems, generally providing high capacity and high power, but with mid range cycle life. And finally, lithium iron phosphate, which are the batteries commonly recommended for boats because they have a high cycle life, low internal resistance and are a lot safer, but lower energy density. One big benefit of lithium batteries is their ability to have a much higher energy density, meaning their ability to hold more potential power than their lead acid counterparts. This is why lithium batteries are generally smaller, 
and lighter compared to traditional lead-acid batteries of the same capacity. Another one of their benefits is their ability to take a much higher charge, or in other words, to charge faster, and to discharge at a much higher rate, or in other words, to power much higher current drawing items, like a water heater. But because of these benefits, for example, running high current loads, we are also increasing heat within the cells of the battery. It's the same thing as running a lot of current through a wire. Do it for a long period of time at a high enough current, things start to get hot and fire could be a possibility. Because of this, if the cells get damaged, there is more risk for heat to form. Damage to the cell could be caused by a thermal failure, the cells being too hot or possibly too cold, mechanical failure, a mechanical issue which could be a physical puncture in the cells, a bad connection, or a failure of the mechanical connection within the pack, an internal or an external short, touching the positive and negative ends together, or general abuse of the battery, not following the company's recommendations. Those situations can create a thing called thermal runaway. A thermal runaway event is a situation that occurs when the cell or part of the cell gets damaged and the temperature inside the cell elevates to a temperature in which the heat cannot be dissipated. The cell's chemicals start a chain reaction resulting in heat inside the cells. This is the fire hazard that many people are scared of. So, if we go back to battery chemistry, we find what temperatures a battery will enter thermal runaway at. For a lithium cobalt oxide battery, a thermal runaway occurs at around 150 Celsius. Nickel magnesium cobalt, or NMC, will have thermal runaway around 210 Celsius. And a lithium iron phosphate LFP battery will have a thermal runaway event around 270 Celsius. For a lead acid battery, thermal runaway occurs at about 400 Celsius. Above those temperatures, the battery starts producing oxygen, which is why they will catch fire and are difficult to extinguish. And this is why a lot of boat batteries you will find are LFP batteries. This is also why if you put an old Tesla car battery in your boat or a nickel magnesium cobalt battery, thermal runaway occurs at a much lower temperature and the fire hazard is larger. So with LFP, it just takes a lot more heat before the battery enters thermal runaway. In fact, the FAA, or the Federal Aviation Administration, one of the most risk-averse organizations in the world, did a comprehensive study on thermal runaway on lithium batteries in different cell configurations. Not only did LFP perform the best from a safety and thermal runaway perspective, they also found that in many tests with LFP chemistry, if one cell in the pack went into thermal runaway, it didn't spread to other cells in the pack. But don't take my word for it, Go and check out the report in the link in the description below. The point is, is that lithium is not created equal. Their benefits are different as well as their drawbacks, including fire risk. If you were to hear in the news there was a lithium fire on a boat, don't assume they are all unsafe. There is a lot of other information needed before jumping to that conclusion. What kind of battery was it? Did it come from the batteries or the wires? Was it a problem with the alternator? There's a lot of possible factors. The US DOT and the UN transport codes, for example, list all of these chemistries under a single umbrella term, lithium ion. So when you read about a lithium fire in the media, it will normally say lithium ion battery. This essentially tells us nothing about the fire because lithium ion could be any one of these materials or any other combinations we have not even discussed. And to be clear, any device storing energy and releasing energy comes with a fire risk. Your phone, laptop, robot vacuum cleaner, electric toothbrush, they all contain a battery that can turn into a fire hazard. So this is all hypothetical, of course, but I also have access to real life data to make my points. Because Dakota Lithium has sold over 350,000 batteries since we started in 2015. We have never had a fire caused by a manufacturing defect on a properly installed system. Nor have we had reports of dump loads that have caused any substantial damage. I'm not saying this because this video is an ad. It's not. It's just because we do have access to this data. That's another myth. There is no such thing as a drop-in lithium replacement. The term lithium drop-in replacement gets thrown around to sell batteries and the idea that the installation will be super easy. Like you take the old one out, put the new one in and ta-da, done. That's not how it works ever and you shouldn't fall into that trap. Lithium batteries are a different technology and need to be treated as such. With lithium batteries, you can charge and discharge batteries much faster. 
And because the current going through is much higher compared to the old style AGMs, most users will need to upgrade to thicker wire to prevent the wire from heating up too much. For that exact same reason, meaning that you can charge the batteries a lot faster, you will need to change the settings of your charge controllers, such as MPPTs, wind generators, shore chargers, alternators, everything. In itself, it does not take too long, but you need to make sure that your charge controllers have a lithium setting, or at the bare minimum, that you can manually change the charge voltage of your device. So we're on Brian's boat, Whisper, and his boat has a, about a 200 amp hour AGM setup, and we're gonna upgrade that to about 600 amp hours of lithium batteries. Now, the lithium batteries could be considered a drop-in because they have an internal BMS, and in theory, you could just connect the wires. That's not really the case because the system's so much smaller. So we're gonna change the wire size, adjust the charger settings, add a bigger inverter to take advantage of the power available. And then we're also gonna make sure the alternator is appropriately attached through a starter battery, through a lead acid starter battery, and a battery to battery charger. So we really can't say that it's a drop-in installation. The term drop-in replacement is used when the battery contains an internal BMS as opposed to an external BMS, which for some weird reason is considered superior. Which brings me to my next myth. There is this conversation I hear a lot about internal BMS being bad and external BMS being good. Before I explain why this makes little sense, let's dive into the concept of a battery management system. The battery management system is a small computer found either within a single battery pack or a small computer external to the pack to which the packs are connected to. Their purpose is only to protect the cells and essentially prevent the thermal runaway conditions we discussed previously. There are many types of BMS out there, but most will monitor charge and discharge current or how much energy is flowing to and from the cells, pack or system voltage, the temperature within the pack, and the balancing of the cells within a pack or a system, meaning that they are all charged at the same level consistently. Each battery type has a set of parameters. In most cases, the BMS will shut down current into or out of the battery if one of these parameters exceeded in order to protect the cells and the pack as a whole. For example, the lithium batteries we have on board, the BMS is set to a max of 15 volts. So if the battery receives more than 15 volts, because let's say our MPPT has failed, then the BMS will stop charging the battery. Same thing if the temperature sensor in the BMS detects that the cells exceed the max temperature. It will shut down charging or discharging. Again, its primary job is to protect the cells and the battery, not to control charging or act as a charge controller. All lithium batteries should have a BMS. Without a BMS, you could end up creating a thermal runaway and thermal runaway creates the risk for fire. Some batteries have a built-in BMS, meaning it's internal. That is the case for Dakota Lithium, Batterborn, and most battery brands you've heard of. But Masterful and some Victron batteries have external BMS, meaning you need to buy and install a BMS separately. The big difference between an internal BMS or an external BMS is that typically, though not all the time, external BMS can interface with multiple packs, which enhances the balancing and can provide a means to change the BMS if there was a failure. An internal BMS is just inside and one less piece of kit you need to purchase. At Dakota Lithium, for example, if the BMS were to fail, the battery has an 11 year warranty, but it's a very rare occurrence that we have a BMS failure. And again, from a safety perspective, the battery wouldn't be functioning anyway, so it's not a big deal. The real issue to look at with internal versus external BMS is the communication between the battery packs. Some BMS systems, regardless if they have an internal or external BMS, are capable of providing external communications. For example, if I have an internal BMS inside a battery pack, I could connect it to another pack and they could help each other balance the cells in the entire system rather than each individual battery but it can also tell other components in the system like the shore charger or the alternator regulator that the battery is about to shut off. So it gives the opportunity for those components to shut down. This would typically avoid potential issues such as dump loads, which we will talk about in a bit later. So in reality, we should not be discussing internal versus external BMS. We should be asking if the BMS has any external communication capacity. And you can find that with an internal or an external BMS. 
This can take the form of Bluetooth or CAN bus connection between the batteries. I do also believe in the idea of having external communications from a BMS because the added level of safety and efficiency it brings. But note that on Polar Seal, our batteries have no external communication and we have sailed for five years with them and 25,000 nautical miles using them extensively in our electrical system. Zero problems. Here's another myth. Dump loads are a widespread issue that lithium created. Okay. So we just talked about dump loads, and before I go any further, we need to understand what that means. When running a charging device with high amperage, like a high output alternator or a shore charger, and we suddenly shut off access to the battery, or if the BMS shuts off charging, a surge in voltage occurs in the system. In a 12 volt system, this could be a spike in voltage anywhere between 40 volts and 120 volts and take as long as 400 milliseconds to decay which doesn't sound very long, but it's a long enough for damage to occur. The major issue with dump loads is that the transient voltage spike or the dump load can cause severe damage to voltage sensitive electronics, as well as our alternators and chargers. Think of it like if you were to get struck by lightning. That's a good enough analogy. But here's a bit of a reality check when it comes to a dump load. They're not new. There are absolutely risks of dump loads with AGMs as well. Lithium has not created the risk for dump loads. If the battery switch were suddenly turned off or if there was a failure in the battery, a dump load could also occur, and they did. Most long-term sailors will have their own story of, or at least knowing someone it happened to. Simply a loose terminal lug bolt causing an AGM cable to pop off in larger seas or heavy vibration would cause this. What's new with lithium is the fact that we're asking the batteries to do so much more. With higher energy storage and higher charge and discharge rates, the cells require a BMS to monitor the loads coming in and out. This is to avoid thermal runaway and in the worst case, fire. So we've talked about the BMS and what it does and how it will shut down charging or discharging under a set of criteria, including too high or low voltage, charge current and temperature as this is where all the confusion starts. As we mentioned previously, some packs have internal BMSs and some have external. Some of these internal devices do not have the ability to communicate externally with equipment or notify the user the BMS is about to shut down. From my perspective, I don't see this being a major issue, but I do agree with the American Boating and Yachting Council that some type of warning would be useful to the skipper. Let me give you a scenario. Most people will have a battery pack or a grouping of more than one battery on their vessel to make their house bank. On board Polar Seal, we have four times 170 amp hour batteries. Each of these batteries is rated for a certain charge current, generally 0.5C or higher. So if you have a 170 amp hour battery, typically you can charge at 85 plus amps. Now, we have four of these batteries in parallel, which allows us to use 85 times four in terms of charging capacity, or in our case, 340 amps. Now let's say one or even two of these batteries fail. We still have 170 amp capacity and we have no charging device on board that could exceed this charging rate. In theory, it will be very rare to see systems that contain, for example, one 200 amp hour battery and 180 amp high output alternator. If you do have a system that has a charger bigger than the charge capability of your lithium batteries, please let me know in the comments below. My point with all of this is dump loads are not new, nor as a company have we found them to be commonplace if the batteries are installed correctly. Care should be taken in the installation process, yes, but designing massive, expensive lithium systems around rare events seems a bit overkill for me. But ultimately, it's up to each one of us to evaluate our level of risk. Okay, so the question of dump loads brings us to another potential problem area, which is how do you connect your lithium batteries to alternators? Again, the benefit of lithium batteries is that they can accept an incredibly high current at a very low internal resistance. These batteries are smart and powerful, and now we're trying to charge them with a historically very basic system, the alternator. In your car, it charges the starter battery, and in the boat, it charges both our starter battery and the house bank, depending on how the system is set up. When we want to charge our lithium battery bank with the alternator, we run into a few issues. But because most alternators are very basic and can't understand that it is connected to a battery that will take whatever it is given, the alternator will keep pumping out power as it is designed to do that. 
When the alternator runs at a high output for a long period of time, it heats up and relies on the fan, which is powered by the engine, to cool off. If the engine is running at low power or low RPM, the fan might not be able to produce enough cool air to cool the alternator. At best, you could fry your alternator, and at worst, you could start a fire. A few ways to avoid this are to have your alternator externally regulated, which I would suggest for all battery types, not just lithium, as it is simply more efficient for your system. Another way to mitigate this risk is to have your alternator charge your lead acid starter battery and then use a battery to battery charger to charge the lithium bank. This is a very safe solution that further limits the dump load risk. The problem is, is that it's not very efficient and limits the benefit of lithium because your battery to battery charger may not charge your lithium batteries at a high rate that they can normally accept. On board Polar Seal, we used to have our alternator connected to a battery to battery charger that would charge our lithium bank out of our AGM starter battery. When we upgraded to a high output alternator, we added an external regulator to the alternator and we can now charge our lithium bank directly from the alternator. And ultimately, we will switch our AGM starter battery with a Dakota lithium starter battery, as we're the first ones to have created a lithium starter battery. And yes, this time I'm doing 100% promotion for Dakota, because this is really cool. Ultimately, whatever we do on sailboats is about managing risk. We must remember almost all the risks found with this type of battery already existed with lead acid too, and almost every boat in the world has at least one lead acid battery on board. My biggest suggestions if you want to have lithium batteries on board and make your installation safe is to, one, purchase a lithium iron phosphate battery, not old Tesla car batteries. Two, buy them from a well-known and reputable supplier, and Dakota Lithium is absolutely one. Those batteries have been installed on thousands of sailboats and we've yet to have a safety issue in a properly installed system. Three, make sure the installation is done correctly. This is normally where I would say reach out to a skilled boat electrician. However, it's my experience that not a lot of marine electricians have the necessary experience with lithium to give you good advice. So instead, I would say find a good lithium battery installer. And four, Make sure that you think about how to manage the alternator charging, either through external regulator or through the starter battery method. Finally, let's talk about lithium and insurance. The topic of insurance and insurance coverage comes up often with regards to the installation of lithium batteries. In my experience, it seems that most of these companies are acting on very little data and the myths we've talked about in this video to make the decisions which affect all of us in the sailing community. We have the responsibility to ensure that we talk educatedly about the facts and if potential issues arise, we know the exact reason why, not just hearsay. These products are safe and have been used in countless applications from home security systems to trips to outer space. So if you like this video, share it with your favorite Facebook sailing group or forum. Just joking, you don't have to do this. Remember though, be cautious where you take information from when it comes to lithium batteries on boats. There are a number of very knowledgeable and respected people in the sailing industry who I respect and who have other views on lithium batteries on sailboats. While I respect them, I would challenge everyone watching to understand that sometimes these same people have commercial arrangements with different businesses and financial incentive not to recommend certain things. I am very clear about my position in business ventures and not everyone is, and I would recommend investigating who you take your advice from before taking that advice too hard. All right, that's it. I hope you learned something today. And with that, I'm gonna help my buddy Brian with his installation. Bye bye.